All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. And thanks for turning in, tuning in to the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation as we kick off the 2022 Summer Webinar Series. My name's Kent Keene, and I'm CSF's Assistant Manager of Lower Midwestern States and Agriculture Policy. During the next several weeks, our goal is to share valuable information on a variety of topics that are affecting our time-honored outdoor traditions. With concepts ranging from access to African trophy import bans, predator hunting and trapping to invasive species, and finally, active forest management, we will hear from industry experts and policymakers, state fish and wildlife agency professionals, and conservation advocates as they present some of the challenges that our outdoor heritage is facing and steps that we as a community can take to ensure that our rights as hunters and anglers are protected and advanced. We hope there's at least one discussion in this series that speaks to you and your interest as a hunter, angler, trapper, recreational shooting sports participant, or conservationist. I do want to remind everyone that the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation is recording today's presentation. However, any recording, rebroadcast, or retransmission of this presentation or any of its parts by the attendees without the express written consent of the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation is prohibited. We'll be kicking off this series with today's entry titled, A Little Goes a Long Way, The Importance of Access in States with Limited Public Lands. While much of this webinar will focus on the eastern half of the country, the conversation about the importance of access, as well as the potential solutions that we plan to discuss, do have application across the country. Following brief presentations by each of our panelists, we will have an opportunity for attendees to submit questions using Zoom's Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. When submitting questions, we do ask that if you would like a particular panelist to answer your question, you reference that in your submission. But before we jump in, it's my honor to introduce the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation's President and CEO, Jeff Crane, for a few opening remarks. Thanks so much, Jeff. Thank you, Kent. I'll add uh, my welcome. And uh, we had such a good, strong, positive turnout when we did this uh, these webinars last year, and, and uh, we decided that this is something we want to move forward with. So thank you all for taking time to join us from the luxury of your own office and computer. Uh, the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, you might have noticed for some of you, we have refreshed our logo, but the mission still remains the same, to work in the policy arena with uh, federal legislators, state legislators and governors uh, on behalf of hunters, anglers, recreational shooters and trappers. Um, so we've been doing this for over 30 years uh, and I think are acknowledged as, as one of the leading groups uh, in terms of ad advocacy uh, on behalf of our outdoor traditions and our sporting heritage. So uh, it's an, it's an passion and a privilege for all of us that work here at CSF to get this opportunity to, to do this on a daily basis, but the, the issues are, are large and daunting, uh, and so it takes a full-time staff and, and a very laser focus on these policy issues, and today's is certainly uh, falls within that. Uh, access clearly is one of the top issues when we talk about what are happening with hunter and angler numbers, and uh, as big a country as the United States is, the, the differences in particular between the Rocky Mountains and the Western states where there's a lot of public lands uh, and federal public lands in particular versus the Eastern part of the United States, which has less opportunity because of less public lands, um, makes the challenges different. So we decided to break this down as Kent said. So. We've got some great panelists here and uh, look forward to an interactive discussion today. And again, just thank you for, for joining us. And I'll turn it back over to you, Ken. Yeah, thanks again, Jeff. Now, before I turn it over to the amazing guest speakers who are joining me today, I want to take a few minutes and really set the stage. Uh, as Jeff said, while many hunters and anglers around the country are fortunate enough to have private lands that they own, lease, or otherwise have permission to access, these opportunities aren't universally available. Uh, personally, this is something that I quickly learned after moving away from the family farm. And admittedly, it created a bit of a challenge as it related to my own hunting participation. And I'm not alone in this, whether due to the ever increasing cost of land ownership in the US or the high premiums currently being drawn on leased properties, or even to a sense of hesitation among some private landowners to grant access due to concerns about the upkeep of their property 
or fears related to liability, it's clear that relying solely on private lands for hunting access is a barrier to participation. Now, thanks to the increasing use of survey data, human dimensioned researchers have learned much about the reliance of sportsmen and women on public lands. In terms of hunter recruitment, retention, and reactivation, collectively referred to as R3, a 2010 study by Responsive Management found that 46% of hunters cited a lack of access as taken away from their enjoyment of hunting and influencing their decision not to hunt. And another 44% of hunters surveyed also indicated that there's simply not enough places to hunt. And though this study is a bit dated, recent conversations in the hunting and angling media suggest that competition for space among hunters and anglers is at an all-time high thanks at least in part to the resurgence in outdoor participation spurred by the COVID-19 pandemic. So here lies the challenge, uh, particularly in those states with limited public lands. We have more people turning to the outdoors to participate in responsible recreation, provide food for their family, or looking for opportunities to join our time-honored outdoor traditions across the nation. But we lack that corresponding increases, increase in places available for them to hunt. This can result in overcrowding on public lands that in turn threaten the quality of each hunter's experience. Now, given the importance of hunting, angling, recreational shooting, and trapping to both the American system of conservation funding and in supporting rural economies, what can we do to ensure that there's adequate opportunity and try to maintain that quality of experience that we've all come to enjoy? Now, some states do this by capping license sales for certain species. You know, think of your lottery systems out west in part to prevent too much competition among hunters and maintain that quality experience. But this approach does very little to increase participation. Recognizing this, many of the same states have looked at the steps necessary to increase access, either by increasing the availability of public lands or by incentivizing landowners to voluntarily offer access on their private land. Either way, we must recognize that providing adequate access is a challenge facing our community as well as the state fish and wildlife agencies charged with managing our nation's public trust resources and providing quality access and opportunities across the nation. For a more in-depth look at the state fish and wildlife agency perspective, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Corey Jager. Corey is the legislative liaison for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. In this role, she focuses on the social and political aspects of fish and wildlife management in the Sooner State. And her work involves understanding hunter and angler interests and in integrating stakeholder input into the decision and policy making processes, as well as working with legislators to advance legislation that benefits wildlife conservation in the state. Corey is a Michigan native, having earned her bachelor's degree in biology from Olivet College and her master's degree in fisheries and wildlife from Michigan State University. Go green. Corey enjoys all things outdoors, whether it be hiking, hunting, fishing, or gardening. Thanks again, Corey. Thanks, Kent. Share my screen. And thank you all for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the public land situation in Oklahoma and how it um, might have some unique attributes, but also some similarities um, that you might see in some of your states. And I also kind of approach this from um, some of the challenges that I've seen working at the Capitol and some of the, um, the political aspects that we've um, had with um, expanding public access in our state. So I wanted to start a little bit with the, the why um, our agency has um, put a high priority on public lands in, in the state. And I think this is probably the best um, explanation of that. We are predominantly a private land state. Um, the federal government and other state agencies own a small fraction of land. Um, not all of that is obviously accessible to hunters and anglers and people interested in wildlife. Um, and our department does own a decent amount of land, but it doesn't even come to 1%. Um, it's actually about 0.77% of the state. So just a small chunk of that is dedicated to um, the mission of our agency. So a lot of our public land, um, as Kent mentioned, I think um, you know several decades ago, we started to notice that access was a really critical piece to keeping um, folks hunting and fishing and buying licenses and keeping the funding model um, working. And so we started purchasing land and I think predominantly our land is, is used for hunters. Um, there are some other uses, but we have done a hunter survey every year um, and ask our hunters if they use those public properties um, for what species and then how important it is to them. And 
consistently we've seen about 30% of our hunters annually access public land. Um, so I'll explain a little bit more about some of the other public access that we have, but if you think about just um, the small portion of our, our state being public, and not all of that being public for hunting, 30% um, of our hunters is pretty significant um, every single year. And the majority of those even say that that hunting access is very critical to their hunting experience. So um, a lot of people using public land, but also a very important piece of their hunting experience. We've also um, heard a lot of anecdotes lately about um, land opportunities, um, access to private land leases in particular, and um, interest from non-residents coming in buying land in Oklahoma um, because it tends to be a little bit less expensive than some of our surrounding states. Um, I've also heard from legislators, um, we've had some changes to some of our marijuana laws and there have been legitimate um, properties purchased by um, foreign entities um, for illegal grow operations. And so there's a lot of challenges um, statewide just with land ownership, not necessarily dealing with hunting and fishing, um, but there's a perception that people are losing access to even their private land. Um, so we asked on our hunter survey um, how private land access for hunting has changed. Um, you can see a lot of people, um, the majority have not seen any change, um, which could mean that they actually don't have access. Um, but we've seen about a third of our hunters um, experience a decline in the access to private land, which even um, further shows that the public access is going to be more critical into the future. So I mentioned earlier, um, the majority of our properties are traditionally used for hunting purposes and fishing purposes. Um, a lot of them have been purchased with federal funding um, that kind of um, goes into that model. But we do um, purchase these properties for other uses and, and expand them where it's appropriate. Obviously the number one thing that um, public property can provide for us is wildlife habitat, um, critical refuges for um, species of greatest conservation need, um, game species, um, that's a, cr a critical point of public access. Uh, one of the things that we've started building upon just um, due to the changes in um, the funding sources, so a lot of our firearms and ammunition, federal revenue is now coming from shooters who aren't necessarily hunters. Um, we have been taking a lot of that money and investing it in building and expanding our shooting ranges on public land. Um, so those folks that may not hunt um, still have access to, to free um, ranges. And of course, our properties also provide several ed educational programs. We have folks that use them for hiking, horseback riding, bird watching, um, you name it, somebody probably does it. So they're not just for hunting and fishing, they, they do allow for a lot of other uses. So going back a little bit to that little slice of pie that's public land. Um, so I mentioned we only own about 0.77% um, of the state, which comes to about 350,000 acres. So we actually don't own a ton of property, um, but we have worked with a lot of partners to expand access in a, a few different ways. So we think have about a million and a half acres um, that we work through licenses and leases with a variety of entities. So the majority is licenses with the Army Corps in our state and Forest Service. And then we also have paid leases to timber companies, which is one of our bigger properties down in Southeast Oklahoma. And then we also have grown our access to a private land program, um, the Oklahoma Land Access Program, um, which is a federal grant funded program, pays landowners to just open up their properties for um, hunting, fishing, and wildlife recreation access. And we've seen a lot of growth in that program as well. So lots of different opportunities for public access in our state that we're trying to provide. So one of the things that I hear at the Capitol a lot is why don't we lease more instead of buying more? Um, and there are some major benefits to leasing, but there's also some challenges that we have for you know, growing our program just on leases. So of course, some of the benefits is it provides landowners with passive income. Um, it is more politically acceptable, at least in our state. And then we can get access to some unique and high quality properties that we might not otherwise be able to purchase. Of course, the challenges with only doing leases or you know, building on our leasing program is um, leases can be a little bit more fluctuating in price, less attainable in the long term um, when you're when you're dumping a lot of money into lease prices, and then of course they can be shorter term, um, giving us less management of autonomy um, when we don't actually own the property. Uh, we don't always uh, we're not guaranteed what we can do on the property in terms of habitat management. Um, although most of our partners do um, allow us to do quite a bit of management work and um, implement regulations uh, that work pretty well. And then more so in our OLEP program, not in our bigger lease programs, but um, leases do tend to result in smaller tracts of property, which isn't necessarily, I say it's a challenge, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but 
um, when we're seeking, you know, contiguous wildlife habitat, those bigger tracks are a little bit more attractive. So then on the ownership side, um, of course, there's the benefit of having larger tracts of property that we can manage for, um, you know, hunting and, and wildlife conservation. But we can also implement long-term management um, on these properties, and that is um, what we what we tend to do. Um, so everything that we do leads to the bigger picture. And of course, when we own property, we have the regulatory and managerial autonomy. So if we need to do a prescribed burn, we can do it without having to go through, um, you know, loops and barriers. And the costs are mostly one time. Um, ownership for us, um, some of the challenges are with the long-term upkeep. Um, obviously, you buy a property, we usually have a, a biologist and a technician in managing those properties. Um, so you're, you have staff time, you have equipment, um, habitat management, and um, just general upkeep of roads and, and everything that goes into that. So that is a long-term cost associated with keeping these properties in, in our ownership. What I've seen is Ownership tends to be a little bit politically um, less acceptable. Uh, even though we don't have a ton of property, um, we tend to be a little bit more of um, a target on the, the land ownership because we do have um, quite a bit more than some other agencies might have. So in the last few years, uh, we have done some more strategic planning and land acquisitions has been part of that. And so we've kind of shifted away from just purchasing opportunistically to purchasing a little bit more strategically. Um, so some of the things that we're focused on moving forward um, in terms of strategic acquisitions is filling in these uh, in holdings and adjacent areas. So you can see in this upper left picture, some of the boxes inside that property are private property. Um, and so we have a lot of properties that um, get parceled out like that. And we're trying to just purchase those up um, as they come available. Uh, one of the other big um, pushes for us and maybe other states is finding properties that are close to urban areas. Um, we're doing some work on relevancy lately and looking at some of the major demographic shifts in our state. We are probably one of the few states that's seeing pretty significant participation still in hunting and fishing, but things are changing and demographics are changing. And some of the recent census data suggests that people are continuing to move to urban areas. Whether or not, not they want access to wildlife resources, they really don't have it when they live in the middle of the city. So that is kind of one of a, it's a strategic um, priority for us, but it's also a challenge because property near the city tends to be more expensive and um, less available for sale. So um, as those opportunities come up, we are seeking those out. Uh, we're also looking for more stream access in our state. And then of course, we're looking for access um, uh, properties that provide habitat for uh, greatest species of greatest conservation need um, or just you know critical wildlife habitat that we might not have otherwise access to. So one other thing that we're focused on is shifting a little bit more toward management of the properties that we have. Um, and one of the challenges that we've seen um, legislatively is the money that goes into our land fund is uh, the majority of it's locked in for acquisition purposes only. And um, we're trying to get access to that more for maintenance. Um, road maintenance tends to be one of the bigger complaints that we see, um, of course, when we have floods and rain. Uh, it makes it a little bit worse, but it is an ongoing cost that we have to keep up with. And so we want to keep the properties that we have intact and, and um, you know, high, have high satisfaction ratings for hunters and anglers, um, but it costs money to do that. And so we're going to continue to work in the next hopefully year uh, to shift how that fund is um, able to be spent. We can spend a little bit more on our maintenance. Um, and one of the last things I wanted to talk about is Again, we don't have a ton of land um, that we own or even offer for public access, um, but on the ownership end, uh, this is probably unique to our state. Uh, we are statutorily required to make payments to counties that are equal to the average ad valorem tax. So essentially we're paying the counties um, a form of a, a, a tax for the properties that we own. Um, so it's not a ton because we don't own a ton of acreage, but we do um, pay about $150,000 a year to those counties. I think initially it probably wasn't seen as a positive thing for the agency because that money could be spent on management activities. Um, however, from a political aspect, I think it, it does show that um, we're trying to invest in those communities and make those properties um, worth expanding. Uh, we're also finishing up a WMA economic impact study. We know anecdotally that a lot of these rural WMAs, um, you know, hunters and anglers come from out of state, out of state and in state from the city spend a lot of money on gas, hotels, food, um, and we haven't really been able to estimate those impacts. And so we should have some data on that soon, which um, I think will show that these are um, good investments in these uh, rural areas. 
And then one of the things that we talk to legislators about is we try not to necessarily purchase ag land, but of course, some of that is part of the properties that we own. And we do about 20,000 acres of ag and grazing leases. So um, we work with those local communities um, and have folks uh, use our properties for that when it makes sense. So that's kind of a quick overview. I don't know if um, we're taking questions right now, but um, if you have them, let me know. I, can't, I don't know if you wanted me to expand on anything either. No, that's great. Thanks, Corey. Um, yes, and if you do have questions for Corey, please feel free to drop them uh, using the Q&A function down at the bottom, and we'll get to those at the end. But Corey, thanks again. Um, for your insight and for sharing that state agency perspective. Uh, one thing that really jumped out to me is the focus near urban areas. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because we're gonna shift gears a little bit. Uh, and I'm now gonna turn it to Carmen Miller from Ducks Unlimited to provide a bit of additional insight from DU's perspective, as well as some of the things that they're doing to address the challenges facing their members. So Carmen is the Director of Public Policy for Ducks Unlimited's Great Plains Regional Office in Bismarck, North Dakota. Do you use Great Plains Regional? Uh, Great Plains Regional Office includes the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Wyoming, Colorado, and Montana. So that's a pretty big chunk of land, Carmen. Um, as a North Dakota native, Carmen spent nearly 30 years in conservation and natural resources law and policy. Prior to joining DU, she was a consultant at the Pew Charitable Trust on federal energy policy and also served as an assistant attorney general for the state of North Dakota, where she represented over 15 different state agencies and argued several cases before the North Dakota Supreme Court. Carmen was an associate at the Vogel Law Firm in North Dakota's largest law firm and is also, or was also an adjunct faculty member in the political science department at Bismarck State College where she taught courses on American government and state and local government. Carmen received her undergraduate degree from St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota and her law degree from Tulane Law School in New Orleans, Louisiana. During college, Carmen studied in Shanghai, China and at Oxford University. Prior to attending law school, she worked in, the, worked in US Senator Kent Conrad's Washington DC office as a legis legislative assistant. She's licensed to practice law in North Dakota and Minnesota and currently lives in Bismarck, North Dakota with her family. Carmen, thanks again for joining us. Uh, thank you, Kent. And I will um, see if I can do my screen share here. Um, it looks like we are. So, uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and greetings from Bismarck. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of a case study that is sort of a hybrid between a, a transaction and a project that we did in Kansas that had the additional impact, not just in terms of um, improving and increasing habitat, but also increasing access. Um, so I am now trying to do, hang on a minute here. All right, there we go. Um, so our mission, Ducks Unlimited conserves and restores and manages wetlands um, and associated habitats for North America's waterfowl. And these habitats benefit other wildlife and also people. And one of the ways in which these habitats benefit people and our projects benefit people is by improving and expanding rec recreational access. Um, we are celebrating 85 years of conservation at Ducks Unlimited. We got our starts in the Dust Bowl of 1937 and have been working across the continent ever since. Um, we also recognize lack of access as a barrier to hunting and outdoor recreation over the past several years. And uh, what do you need to go duck hunting? Well, some ducks would be good, but a place to hunt is even a more important starting point. Um, some things that we do to support access, any land, owned by Ducks Unlimited, our policy is that it is open to the public um, during our time of ownership. We have consistently supported increased access on public lands over the past several years. Uh, multiple administrations have undergone rulemakings that have expanded access, hunting access on various wildlife refuges throughout the country. We have consistently applauded and supported those efforts and, uh, and look forward to continuing to do that. Um, our projects, in addition to improving and increasing habitat, also have the other benefit uh, frequently of increasing public access. Um, this is a little map just to show you. It's, um, it's actually supposed to be an interact interactive map that's on our website, and I lack the tech capability to do the interactive portion with you, but it's just a snapshot, and what it shows you is the little yellow dots are public lands where there have been Ducks Unlimited projects that also allow public hunting. 
So as you can see, we get around. Um, we've had projects that have contributed to public access in all 50 states. So I want to focus a little bit on the Great Plains region where I work. As you said, it's a seven state region and a little bit more specifically on the true Plains states of the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Kansas, which are areas, as you said, a large chunk of land right in the middle of the country, a lot of wildlife, a lot of people hunting, but characterized by really not a lot of public lands. And the numbers on the maps of the states indicate where the states rank in terms of having public land. Uh, North and South Dakota are kind of in the middle bottom. Uh, Nebraska and Kansas are 48th and 49th. And Kansas ranks 49th in terms of public land in the country. Um, the last state in the country is Rhode Island. Uh, 49th means they, they actually have one, only 1.9% 1 of the land in Kansas is publicly owned. Um, and so a very, very small portion. Another interesting thing about these states is that they have a large number of hunters. All four of these states have rank in the top 20 in terms of percentage of residents who have hunting licenses. So we are talking about a public resource that exists largely on private lands and in places where you don't have a lot of public resources. And I said that, you know, Kansas is 49th, Rhode Island is 50th. Here's just to give you a perspective on that is the footprint of little teeny tiny Rhode Island inside the footprint of the Sunflower State. So uh, pretty distinctive land masses for these states, uh, pretty different hunting populations, yet almost the same amount of public land. Um, so we have a lot of people hunting in places where not a lot of public land. So where is everybody hunting? Well, they're doing it on private lands. They're doing it on private lands um, based on the generosity and cooperation of private landowners who are assisted and incentivized by a wide variety of public, federal, and state-based based programs that allow, that in, encourage and incentivize landowners to allow walk-in hunting access on their property. And we have long supported these at the federal and state level, uh, whether it's the, what they call plots, the private lands open to sportsmen up in North Dakota, or the program in Kansas, that's one of the oldest and most successful programs. It was started in 1994. It's got over a million acres enrolled, the Walk-In Hunting Access Program, also known as WEHA. And it has served as a model for um, uh, these types of programs around the country. Um, and as I said, these are really, really critical in providing assets, this access in, in um, landscapes where you don't have a lot of public opportunities. So getting more specific to the situation in Kansas in our case study, um, in these landscapes where you don't have a lot of public lands, sometimes public lands and acquisitions are viewed with a little bit of skepticism, both sort of publicly and politically. Um, these are landscapes that are dominated by agricultural production. There is a, um, um, that is seen as a priority. There are concerns about losing additional agricultural production to other um, pressures on the landscape. And this manifests itself in a number of ways, this type of skepticism. And um, we have seen, uh, you know, we're, I think somebody's gonna talk a little bit about no net gain efforts that, that have been gaining a little traction around the country, but there's, they're not really that new. In Kansas, state law actually prohibits the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks from acquiring parcels of land in excess of 160 acres without legislative approval. And that means real legislative approval. That doesn't mean just putting it in as a butt line item in your budget and you know, going through the appropriations process. This means there will be a full-fledged bill with hearings and committees and votes by both houses and being signed by the governor. So it is a significant process. Which gets us to the Byron Walker Wildlife Area, a transaction and project that we assisted with, Ducks Unlimited, um, in Kansas that resulted in a uh, significant expansion of a very critical hunting and recreational resource. I have to jump in here and first of all say that I feel a little sheepish talking about this in the presence of Chris Timerson, who I believe is on the call, um, who in his former position as um, counsel for the Department of Wildlife and Parks in Kansas was absolutely instrumental in, in this effort. And so, you know, this is, I don't want to portray this as some sort of sole effort that was done by Ducks Unlimited. Um, in fact, it was, it was basically all we, our efforts were merely assistive of the department's 
um, goals and effort in this transaction. So the Barren Walker Wildlife Area, little yellow star on the bottom of the map of Kansas, is a um, large recreational area in south central Kansas, uh, a little bit west of Wichita. And this is what we like to call sort of a facilitative acquisition. And what happened is an adjacent landowner approached the department about possibly purchasing land that would help them expand the wildlife area. And because of the legislative restriction, they can't just show up with a check. They have to you know, get legislative approval before they acquire the property, which puts the landowner in kind of a you know, holding pattern and sort of an awkward situation. You don't wanna say, okay, well, we'd really like to sell this land, but we have to get approval from the legislature. And it might take a year, it might take two years. And meanwhile, you're sitting there waiting for this transaction to be completed. So what we were able to do was purchase the property from the landowner and, and then hold it and do some restorative work while the department worked with partners and other collaborators um, to shore up the legislative process. Um, a couple of background about our involvement in these sorts of facilitative transactions. We are very careful, very strategic, very specific and limited in our approaches to land acquisition. It will only happen with local support, um, agency collaborators, partners with a mix of private and public funding. It will be based on habitat value and also the opportunity for enhanced and increased recreation access will be a factor. Our policy is to only hold land for about three to five years and then to return it either to public or private ownership. And um, quite often this habitat conservation results in expanded public access. So here's a little map, a little more specific about the Byron Walker wildlife area. The out area in yellow was the pre-existing wildlife area and the area outlined in red was the, the, the 493 acres adjacent that were going to result in the expansion. So um, why was this so attractive? Well, this is an area that is 45 miles west of Wichita, which is the largest metropolitan area in Kansas. And it is a 4,000 acre recreation hub, a fishing lake, a wildlife area with all sorts of recreational opportunities. Um, for us, it was attractive because it's the largest concentration of midwintering mallards in the state of Kansas. Also a lot of other species hunting. It's very popular, gets a lot of use, averages about 60,000 visitors a year. So a really, really important resource. And this was an unprecedented unique opportunity to not only expand it by almost 500 acres, but to provide some new access based on certain roadways. And this is a map, the yellow arrows show you sort of the, the roadways that were opened up um, and provided some additional access to this area. So the legislative process, um, as I said, not exactly an overnight sensation. It is something that is deliberative and took some time. And in this case, it was four years from the initial outreach by the landowners to passage of the ultimate bill. I mean, it's not as bad as it sounds. One of those years included a COVID year where the legislature sort of shut down. So, you know, I mean, that was through a wrench into a few different things. But what was really critical here was um, getting support of the local legislators, those representatives who were representing the area of the transaction and making sure that they could be sponsors of the bill and that they could be supportive and that they understood the nature of the transaction. We also had to get um, approval from the local county commission, the local city commission, and the department was very, I mean, did a ton of outreach education in making everybody comfortable with this transaction and making sure that they understood some of the critical factors, which were things like the fact that the property had been purchased by us at appraised value, the fact that it was going to be sold to the department at appraised value. There were going to be no Kansas tax dollars going to this. This was all, you know, sportsman's dollars and other things coming from other sources. Uh, the fact that Ducks Unlimited had paid taxes on it during our ownership and that the Kansas Department was also going to pay taxes on it during their ownership was, was critical um, in selling this politically. Um, there had, the transaction had involved a land swap with an adjacent landowner uh, where he obtained some crop land in exchange for grassland that had a little higher habitat value. So it was really a very collaborative, partner-driven effort. The other thing I want to point out is we are not, these, these transactions are not unique to Ducks Unlimited. We are not the only NGO that has assisted in this type of a transaction or transfer with the department. 
um, because of the restriction and the nature of this, it's something that I believe Pheasants Forever did one a few years ago. So, I mean, you have a number of entities who are able to step in and look at these types of, of transactions when need be. Um, but four years later, success. And we were able to get the bill passed that allowed the transaction to occur in the 2021 legislature. And a few months later, here we were celebrating at the Kingman Wildlife Area with local legislators, uh, congressional staff, department staff, volunteers, partners, people who had all been instrumental in this effort. And I think it's, it's, it shows an example of how our habitat work also has the impact and the added benefit of adding additional um, access, but how do you do this in a place where there's not a lot, of, a lot of public, a lot of public opportunity? You do it strategically, carefully, slowly, and with a lot of hard work. So that's all I have for now. All right, thanks so much, Carmen. I really appreciate that, and I have to admit, I, I did a little bit of a victory dance when that bill finally passed. So it's great to hear you present on it here. So as we've discussed, there's clearly a growing need for public access, um, particularly across the eastern half of the country, where we're struggling to provide adequate opportunities uh, due to the uh, limited availability of public land. Uh, to make things more challenging, as Carmen mentioned, some states have also seen recent attempts to cap public land ownership, uh, often citing unfounded claims that these public land acquisitions or keeping land out of the hands of the next generation of landowners. Um, a lot of times that next generation of farmers is what we hear. Uh, these efforts include a series of bills that have been introduced which seek to require state agencies to sell off land before any additional property can be purchased or received. Uh, again, termed no net gain bills by the sporting conservation community, these bills represent a pretty significant threat to sportsmen and women who rely on public access. But fortunately, most of these efforts have been defeated you know, thanks to the collective work of the sportsman's community and engaged legislators who have fought on our behalf. In fact, if, uh, if you're a legislator and have fought against one of these bills with us, you're here today, thank you again for your work. I mean, we really appreciate it. Many of the successes in fighting back these no net gain bills comes from the realization that public land acquisitions by state fish and wildlife agencies are conducted between the agency and a willing seller. Um, we're talking about private landowners who cherish conservation and appreciate the opportunity to allow their properties to contribute to the enjoyment of their fellow sportsmen and women, not state agencies forcing any individual to give up any property rights. If a landowner doesn't wish to sell, or in many cases gift their property for the purpose of public access, nobody's going to force them. Uh, we've also seen, as Carmen mentioned, that we have the ability to point out, we're not talking about using taxpayer dollars, we're talking about sportsman dollars to make these purchases. Uh, in addition to the American system of conservation funding, we've seen recent victories at the congressional level through the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act or the American Conservation Enhancement Act that have really allowed us to get the most bang for our buck from a sportsman's perspective. But at the state level, another opportunity to counter efforts to cap public land ownership exists in the form of no net loss legislation. Exactly like it sounds, no net loss creates that baseline amount of public lands available for public access that the state is expected to maintain. Now, several states have adopted some form of no net loss legislation, recognizing the important role that these lands play in supporting conservation efforts and providing opportunities for sportsmen and women to participate in our time honored outdoor traditions while supporting the American system of conservation funding and rural economies. Uh, for some additional background on a recent no net loss victory, it's my honor to turn it over now to my friend and colleague, Mark Lance. Mark joined CSF in August of 2020 as the Southeastern States Coordinator. As part of the CSF States Program Team, Mark works with Legislative Sportsman's Caucuses and members of the Governor's Sportsman's Caucus in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Prior to coming on full time, Mark also served as a Brad Rouse Policy Fellow during the summer of 2019. Mark's a lifelong Mississippian, developed an early passion for wildlife conservation through hunting and fishing. In November of 2020, Mark graduated from the College of Forest Resources at Mississippi State University with a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife, Fisheries, and Aquaculture. While in school, Mark was recognized by the Rocky Mountain Mount Foundation as one of their Wildlife Leadership Award winners and was selected as a William A. Dimmer Program Scholar by the Boone and Crockett Club. 
Mark participated in numerous hunter outreach and youth engagement events while in school and also served as a Montgomery Leadership Program Fellow where he led community service projects on his local National Wildlife Refuge. Mark enjoys many different types of outdoor recreation, particularly chasing turkeys in the spring. And thanks again for joining me today, Mark. Thank you for that introduction, Kent. And thank you to our viewers who are joining us for today's webinar. Uh, we greatly appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Uh, as Kent mentioned in my introduction, I work in six states across the Southeast, including the state of Georgia. And one piece of legislation that was a priority for the Georgia Legislative Sportsman's Caucus this year was House Bill 1349, which updated Georgia's no net law statute. As Kent and some of our other panelists have touched on already, many hunters utilize public lands and lack of access to hunting lands is cited as a primary reason that hunters stop participating in the sport. In the Southeast, private lands dominate the landscape, making public land access that much more important. And for example, in Georgia specifically, over 90% of the state is privately owned, making public land access incredibly important to many of the state sportsmen and women. Georgia, Georgia's no net loss statute set 2005 as the baseline year to measure the acreage available for hunting opportunities on Department of Natural Resources managed state owned lands. This accounting protected 300,000 acres for hunting access. However, since 2005, the DNR has acquired new WMAs open to hunting that were not included in the original baseline. So they would not be protected under the no net loss statute, which made this very important to update. You can fast forward to today and House Bill 1349 updated the baseline to reflect more than 200,000 acres that have become part of the public trust in Georgia over the past 17 years, bringing the total number of acres open to public access to 500,000. The bill was sponsored by Georgia Sportsman's Caucus members, numerous Georgia Sportsman's Caucus members, and was supported by the DNR and numerous NGOs. It also passed both chambers unanimously, which resulted in a tremendous win for Georgia's hunters. Protecting public access to half a million acres safeguards Georgia's rich outdoor heritage by protecting public hunting land from development for future generations of Georgians to enjoy. While the statute does not cover all public hunting acreage in Georgia, uh, for example, U.S. Forest Service lands that are leased by the DNR from timber companies, uh, the no net law statute is still significant as the effect would be for legislators that might consider attempting to sell state lands to reevaluate their position. And while other states across the region have faced threats from state legislators attempting to transfer wildlife management areas away, the caucus and the Georgia General Assembly recognize the importance of protecting the state's investments and its WMA system provide and maintain hunting access. It's encouraging to see states such as Georgia, whose lands are primarily privately owned, be proactive in protecting lands that provide access to the everyday sportsman. With that, Kent, that provides a brief synopsis of the recent no net loss effort in Georgia, and I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thanks again, Mark. Uh, with that, we'd like to open up the conversation uh, by answering questions from the audience. So again, if you do have any questions, please drop them in using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, if you would like your question answered by a specific member of the panel, please be sure to indicate that in your question. And we'll go ahead and get things started with a few that we've already gotten the hopper. Uh, the first one is for both Corey and Carmen. Uh, are states trending towards looking at access issues within urban areas as part of their R3 efforts as well? Um, I can start for Oklahoma situation. So um, not so much on the hunting end, uh, but for a long time, we have seen the trend on fishing where people aren't traveling as far to go fishing. And so we've worked with a lot of city partners to expand fishing access in urban areas. Um, but we're actually launching this relevancy initiative to kind of look at um, some things like that. And I think urban areas is gonna be one of the areas that we start looking at a little bit more for how do we provide some of that access within cities or nearby cities. So, but we haven't really done a ton um, other than just trying to find opportunities to buy and lease land outside the metro areas. Yeah, I can add a couple of things and I, I don't wanna to get too ahead of myself on speaking for the Department of Kansas, but you know, one of the reasons the Byron Walker acquisition was so attractive was because of the proximity to Wichita and the, the, the need uh, to serve that population. 
In addition to the WeHa program that they have, they also have a new pilot project. It's called iWeHa, and it's basically like a like an, a reservation system. So it's it's walk in access, but it's subject to reservation. And so a little bit. And, and my understanding is that is being targeted. The pilot for it is starting out in or in areas that are closer that have some urban proximity. So that's um yeah a couple of couple of ways in which some some of the places I know are looking at those issues. Great, thank you both so much. Uh, another one here, though we're focused on states with limited private lands, what are some of the challenges that you see related to sportsman access on private lands, particularly in those states with greater amount of public lands? Uh, so Carmen, from the VPA HIP perspective, would you have any insight here? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I got a little distracted or a little confused, missed a couple of yeah. things. So, though we're focused on states with limited public lands, uh, what are some of the challenges that we see related to sportsman's access on private lands? Okay, yeah, well, I mean, actually, encourage, you know, it's, it's interesting, encouraging uh, the programs that incentivize landowners to do this have, have been successful and popular, particularly in, you know, the states where, where, where I'm working, but you continue to maintain that enthusiasm. And it's funny, I was just looking at the WeHa um, website yesterday, and even to just read the material, you have to like read through and say, yes, I will be a responsible hunter, I will do this, and this is, and this can be revoked at any time. And so, you know, the importance of landowner relations is really, really critical in these programs. I know that like Kansas and Nebraska also use the VPA HIP um, a lot. They are, are, are frequent grantees in that and use it as sort of a supplement to their existing, and it allows them to give some different things. My understanding is that the state-based programs might have shorter term contracts or a range, but then the federal-based programs might have longer range uh, um, um, contracts for landowners. So it just gives them uh, you know, more options for approaching landowners in this space. Great, thanks, Carmen. And Corey, for reference, the OLAP program, is that funded through VPA HIP and the Farm Bill? Yeah, it, yeah, and we actually met with Kansas when we were developing our program because it really is kind of the premier um, example of how to run that program. So, um, but we've only had it for four years, um, and I think we might actually be up to about ninety thousand acres now. So, um, doing okay. But you know, one of the targets has been smaller tracts of land outside the city. And it just is so expensive, um, at least in Oklahoma, that we haven't really been able to do that. And so we've, we've probably spent a lot more of those leases on bigger tracts of land out in the paint handle, which is much further from the city. So kind of the opposite, but. Thank you. And kind of picking backing off of that question, Corey, uh, can you speak to some of the concerns that landowners might have with allowing public access either through the OLAP program or something similar? Yeah, so um, OLAP is pretty generally popular. Um, we have had some, some issues with neighboring landowners who didn't really want their neighbor to open up property and hear shotguns. And um, we've had a couple minor conflicts uh, with landowners trying to run off hunters. Um, but usually those are resolved because it is a private property issue and it's, it's not, you know, we're just tr trying to pr provide public access. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? I'm really just trying to get at some of those concerns that landowners have with uh, opening land up for public access, either through OLAP or through similar programs. Um, so the other thing that we've seen, um, I mean, it's it's kind of the neighboring landowner challenges that we have even with OLAP that we have on our public lands. Um, you know, our biologists, their phone numbers are usually listed um, as the best contact for landowners to reach out to, but um, fences that are broken that need to be repaired and whose who's responsibility is that is for that. And so we try to do a lot of cost sharing with landowners. And um, I think we're, we're maybe trying to work with some of the farm farming and ranching groups a little bit more to put our biologists in front of their, their local community a little bit more and, and build those relationships. Um, because we have had a, a few minor issues, I think, that just build up over time. Um, but other than that, I'm, I'm not sure other than neighboring landowners that we've heard too many individual challenges. Um, I mean, the long, the thing that you mentioned is, 
the, the long-term concern of, I'm not gonna be able to purchase this property in the future if you take it off the rolls. Um, you know, less for me when the state and federal agencies uh, purchase land. So that's probably the biggest thing that we hear. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, Mark, we have one for you, kind of a process question on your discussion from Georgia. And then Carmen, I'll turn it to you a little bit to talk about how you approach the Kingman County tract in Kansas, because I think that would be valuable here. But Mark, uh, can you talk a little bit about the starting point um, for the no net loss discussion there in Georgia? Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned in my original presentation, the, the baseline had originally been set in 2005. Uh, which covered 300,000 acres and uh, members of our uh, Georgia Legislative Sports Caucus and many of our in-state partners got together and said, well, you know, the, the DNR has picked up uh, numerous other WMAs that aren't covered under that statute and we need to come to the table and, uh, and update that. And that's where we went from there. Gotcha, thanks. Um, Carmen, kind of building off that, there in Kansas, you mentioned uh, engaging those local legislators and explaining the, the benefits there. Um, could you speak to that in a little bit more detail? How were you able to accomplish that? Right. Well, starting with the you know legislative requirement that that basically this had to be approved, the transaction had to be approved. So 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 we knew that, and working with the department as well, that having the local legislator who represents the district where um, this transaction was happening was going to be critical. So, um, and I can't even, you know, I mean, the um, department really engaged in a lot of outreach and education um, with those local legislators. And at one point, I mean, one of them retired or wasn't reelected. So we had to kind of regroup because we had new people that had to be brought into the fold in terms of, you know, getting them up to speed on the nature of the transaction and making sure that they're comfortable with it and that they understood from na that neighboring landowners were okay. And, and sometimes what happens in these circumstances is, you know, it's land that maybe, you know, a neighbor, you're wanting to make sure that a neighbor hasn't been, you know, um, left out of a transaction or an opportunity. And so that was critical, explaining that, that no, no one else was really interested in this. In fact, there was a neighbor who, uh, we also, you know, retained the tenant, an agricultural grazing tenant who was on the property. And um, I mean, as, as, as you all know, I mean, grazing and and uh, cows and ducks are quite compatible. And so those agricultural practices and, and, and a lot of other agricultural practices are compatible with wildlife habitat. That's what we're dealing with in this part of the country where again, you have a public resource existing on private land and trying to find that balance. But really it started with making sure that folks in the local, under, uh, local community understood the nature of the transaction and worked um, burdened by a bunch of misinformation, you know, thinking that this had been some sort of, um, you know, um, you know, I mean, like that they weren't paying taxes or that this was, you know, sold at some high value that nobody else could have afforded or something like that. Just, you know, the, the market-based nature of the transaction, um, the fact that all the entities involved were paying taxes, um, understanding, and also, I mean, local people understood the value of this resource to the community. Um, this is the premier attraction of Kingman County. If you go on the Kingman County website, the first thing it talks about is the Byron Walker Wildlife Area. So you had a lot of people who also understood the importance of this to the local recreation economy. So making sure that that story was told and, and just making sure that everybody was comfortable with the process. And really the, the department was very, very committed to making the process work and also making sure that this, this, was, this was also going to have benefits long-term. If you want to continue to have these transactions in the future, you know, um, being upfront about it and helping to explain things and making people more comfortable with these transactions was only going to benefit everybody involved um, long-term. Great, thanks. And I, I appreciate you going uh, with the economic route there at the end, uh, because that leads into this question really well. And Corey, I don't think there's anybody uh, better suited to speak to this uh, from a conservation funding perspective than somebody from the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. So we've mentioned the American System of Conservation Funding several times, but would you take just a couple moments to talk about what the ASCF means in Oklahoma specifically and how decreasing public access could be a threat to the ability of your agency to do its job? 
Yeah, so that's a really good question. So I think I, I hit on this a little bit, but um, obviously hunters and anglers uh, pay for the bulk of our work in Oklahoma. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, we don't get any state appropriations and the majority of our money is still traditionally from that um, original funding model. Um, we still are seeing a growth in our hunter population per capita, um, but we aren't seeing as much growth in our fishing population. And so we're kind of um, trying to get ahead of some of these curves and really both push on the R3 aspects, but also push on the relevancy aspects and find opportunities maybe for some, some new funding. Um, but one of the challenges that we have seen is people want to, if they want to get out and be in wildlife, they need a place to do that. Um, we don't really even have a ton of state parks in our state. Um, and they all have, you know, our properties have pretty limited access. There are many that you can do a lot of different activities on, but the primary purpose has been hunting and fishing. Um, and so um, we're kind of in this um, trying to figure out, you know, do we expand access in our WMAs without disenfranchising our hunters and anglers, um, or do we try to continue to focus on the hunting and fishing community in building that? And I think it's going to be a little bit of both moving forward, but access to, to habitat and wildlife um, for anybody that hunts fish or just wants to be around wildlife is really important. So, um, you know, we've been asked a lot at the Capitol, how much land is enough? Um, we don't have a ton of land that we own. Um, we don't have a good answer to that. It, you know, I don't think our goal is to take over the entire state, but I would probably say that we don't have enough access right now. Um, and I think you can see that when, when there are bills that threaten our ability to purchase more land or even lease more land um, at the Capitol, because we've seen our partners show up and, and help defeat a lot of that legislation that really limits that. So um, yeah, I think it, it will impact it if, if we can't expand access um, because there just isn't any way to, to experience wildlife if you don't have the ability to have your own land or, or go somewhere. Gotcha. Thank you for that. And I, uh, I'm sure I speak for several when I say we're looking forward to seeing the economic impact study come out soon. Um, with that, we do have a couple other questions, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, we'll try to get to those via email and get those back out to those who ask. Thank you again, everybody, uh, for joining us today. We hope that you'll be able to join us for the next virtual policy briefing on June 23rd for a discussion titled Unintended Consequences, How American Trophy Import Bans Harm Conservation Efforts Abroad. For those of you who are interested in a more immersive experience on these and other sportsman-related policy topics, we encourage you to join us in Bozeman, Montana for the annual NASC Sportsman Legislator Summit from November 29th to December 2nd. This hallmark event for State Legislative Sportsman's Caucus members and the broader sporting community will feature three days of policy discussions, demonstrations, and outdoor activities. Early bird registration is now open, and additional information can be found in the chat or by simply searching nasksummit.org. And if you do have any additional questions uh, following these today's webinar, please feel welcome to contact your regional representative within CSF State's program team. Uh, we'll be happy to circle up with the speakers, try to get an answer and get back to you just as soon as we can. And with that, thanks again to everybody for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to each of the panelists, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.